Today's scripture reading is from Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 30. A dispute arose among them as to which one was the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest of you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at, is it not the one at the table? But I am among you one as who serves. You are those who have stood by me in all of my trials, and I confer on you just as my Father has conferred on me a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of, e of Israel. This is the written word of God for the living Word of God, and we say, thanks, thanks be to God. God. Good morning, I'm Dan Reeder, and this is my beautiful, adoring, smart wife, Katie. <laughs> if you guys can't tell, she wrote this, and uh, she knew this would be the first time I'm reading it. When we were asked to speak during the stewardship moment, we thought, oh wow, this should be super fun to talk about money in church. And then we thought, why not make it even more uncomfortable and double down on the awkward and add the topic of divorce? Let me back into this. When I started dating my wife, we were very involved in the church youth group. And our youth pastor at the time used to tell us often that the two biggest factors contributing to divorce in today's society were in-laws and finances. I thought it was odd at the time that he was dishing out marriage advice to high schoolers, but in hindsight, he must have seen the writing on the walls. I think our youth pastor knew we hit the in-law jackpot, and I'm not just saying that because our in-laws are both in the congregation right now. <laughs> um, we're surrounded by strong, a strong support system of family and friends, and we love this church community. So when we were first married, with those words of wisdom from our youth pastor ringing in our ears, we sat down and had a serious discussion about our finances. We felt very fortunate to have both come from similar backgrounds where we can't ever remember a time when we didn't tithe. It was instilled in both of us at a young age by our awesome parents that our first fruits would be the first part of every dollar belonging to God. Whether it was 10 cents of a dollar earned through babysitting, or $10 of the first hundred earned by bagging groceries at the Jones Bridge Publix, it was natural to us to give to God before considered the remaining portion of our own. We are now in our 11th year of marriage with four beautiful children, and we have never felt stronger as a couple or further from that D word, despite the stresses that come along with this stage of our life, and particularly those four beautiful children. We feel truly blessed beyond measure and honestly credit giving our first fruits to God for many of these blessings. And don't let me mislead you. I'm not saying that if you give, you get, like a genie that's in a bottle, that you will never have a problem or a care. I'm saying through cheerful, intentional giving, we have found our lives transformed and our priorities clear, which makes it possible to realize so many of our dreams in times of both feast and phantom, phantom, famine, we credit keeping God first and helping to establish this peace within us. And while financial giving is a key component of the stewardship campaign, our vows to the church talk about giving through our presence, our gifts, and our service. Dan and I have served in many capacities in this church, from vacation Bible school to lay leadership to trustees to the upcoming extravaganza egg hunt, March 24th at 4 p.m., rain or shine. <laughs> yes, that actually was a shameless plug, so bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring your neighbor's friends. And we can speak from experience, and I can promise you that there will never be a more rewarding experience 
than plugging into your God-given gifts and using them to serve through your time and presence within the church. Now notice there I did not say easy, I said rewarding. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 says, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his own heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Giving is certainly an individual decision, and Dan and I are not here to tell you what to do. We can only share our own story and acknowledge that continuing to commit that first portion to God has helped us establish a strong foundation. Yes, it does mean sometimes saying no to more and developing patience and self-control when it comes to the wants in life. But saying no and learning to wait are two of the biggest gifts we have discovered and which we hope to cultivate in our own children. Choosing to say no to a purchase because we have allocated that money to a tithe and intentionally putting others first before spending on ourselves gives us space to breathe and dream. And if you're new here, I might need to apologize because I'm about to preach for a moment. This church means so much to Dan and me. We met here, we were married here, we have baptized our children here, we have met the best of friends here, and we have been comforted in our darkest moments by this church family as we celebrated the lives of sweet family and friends here. This church is a living, breathing extension of our lives. And if church to you only means a hands-off, don't get involved, quiet spot to get pumped up for another week, I beg you to reconsider what you want church to mean to you, because you can find that kind of comfort and energy at a Starbucks. And after you reconsider what you want it to mean to you, come find me and I will help you get plugged in. We've got this awesome egg hunt coming up. I would love your help. So come find me sooner than later. <laughs> Committing to giving has helped us feel part of the fabric of Johns Creek United Methodist Church and the world beyond. No matter where you are in your personal journey, I encourage you to prayerfully consider committing to a tithe. If the biblical 10% is too intimidating, we encourage you to step out in faith and just start somewhere. Create a roadmap, maybe begin at 5% and increase each year until you reach that biblical standard. I promise you your life will change for the better. When the days are filled with trials at work or personal defeat with multiple timeout sessions with our own children, all signs that point to failure, and even when the days are filled with really hard stuff like cancer and heartache and shootings and all that icky, awful stuff of life, we can regroup as a couple, we can regroup as a family, and we can come back to the foundation of God first and know that our priorities are straight. We are truly making a difference in the world at large by putting others before ourselves living out God's ultimate calling to love one another. Thank you for your time. Can we continue to say that our world is in excellent hands with our young people? Abe Parker, this choir, our youth, we are blessed that God has this. Amen. Please join me in a time of prayer. Holy One, I thank you. On behalf of our congregation, on this day, as we celebrate people who love you, who serve you, who know that you are the hope of our life and the source of our strength. And now, God, as all of worship is our gift to you, we offer these words and pray that the meditation of our hearts together will be a blessing in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Friends, as I glanced at my watch and it's 10 minutes till 12, it's really 10 minutes to 11. Look how long I get to preach. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I want us to think about this powerful passage of Scripture this morning. As our clergy team has been working on this text, as we've been sitting with it, praying over it, writing it, preaching it, we feel so compelled that it is a beautiful way for us to think about how we serve Jesus. I want us to think about this phrase, and then I want us to move into where this is located and what it means for us. The hour has come, and we need to take our place at the table with him. In the words of our practice in the adopt -a family season this past December, if not now, when? If not us, who? We need to take our place at the table with him. We enter into this story as we are moving through the sermon series and the five practices of discipleship 
prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And today we're talking about service. We're celebrating the volunteers. I hope you will come and join us as we are so grateful for all of those who serve. Next week we will hear about witness. And as we listen to these powerful discipleship vows, I want us to think about what has just happened in the story. We have just followed the Passover meal. We have just listened to the story of Jesus serving and sharing in the bread and the cup at his table. We are caught here in the middle of this story, beginning to verse 24, with the disciples arguing, squabbling like little children. Who is the greatest among us? Have you ever heard someone say, oh, I'm their favorite? I hear in war time somebody say, oh, God loves you, but I'm his favorite. Can you imagine what it is like after knowing in Jesus' heart what is about to happen to him? He has just broken bread. He has just offered the cup. He has just told them that someone is going to betray him. And they're at the table arguing over who is the greatest. He sets them straight about God's plan and their place in the kingdom. One of my favorite scholars, who was my New Testament professor, Luke Timothy Johnson, said this about this passage and the preceding verses. In this passage, we consider how it sets the stage for the suffering of the Messiah, providing at once a contrast between the outer plot, that is the machinery of betrayal, and the inner story, the meaning of the events. The chief priests and the temple officers entered into a financial agreement with Judas. They will pay him if he will hand Jesus over. The writer of the gospel notes that they are, quote, delighted, and the reader is not the least bit surprised. Think about it. In this season of Lent, as we think about the journey of Jesus, as we think about he knows what's coming, we think about how he came, he came to earth, he came to love God's people. His mission was to offer them love and life and hope. And yet, from the very beginning, the very people who are supposed to be his people set out to reject him, set out to be afraid of him, set out to resent his message. Luke Johnson goes on to write, the reader is not the least bit surprised since from the start of Jesus' ministry, the leadership has been opposed to him. And since his arrival in Jerusalem, they have been actively seeking his removal. Imagine how he must have felt. Judas is at the table, and he will be the one to act on behalf of Jesus' adversaries. Luke Johnson goes on to say how Judas symbolically represents the larger community of disbelievers who don't want Jesus to be in the front and center, who don't want people to follow him. And for anyone who has suffered the hands of of those who have betrayed. It is heartbreaking. It is a story that resonates, and it's interesting how that works for Jesus as it works for any of us who've been through betrayal, who've been hurt by people that we love and trusted and thought had our back. The relationship has to be there before betrayal can happen. You will never hear someone say, I was betrayed by a total stranger, by some shifty-eyed, sleazy person who betrayed... How can they betray you if they don't know you? How can you feel that loss of a relationship if you haven't been in a relationship? The disciples are in their relationship with Jesus, and so hearing the words about being betrayed shakes them to their core. So in verse 23, just before we read verse 24, this is what they say. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this, talking about, Judas and Jesus saying there is one at this table who will betray me so they began to say which one of us and immediately they fall into squabbling over who's the greatest can you imagine if they can prove their worth maybe they won't be the one he's thinking of the image of this table and Jesus serving takes on such a powerful meeting we're talking about plugging into the power of God through service here they are worried about which one is the greatest and they want to not think about themselves capable of betraying him. And in this question of who is the greatest, squabbling like these children, Jesus points them to the bigger picture. 
I want, I want you to hear this again. This is just so interesting how he turns the phrase. The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? I am among you as one who serves. And then he goes on to say, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And we read that and we pass right over that before we realize that Jesus has just said to them words of accountability. They have not stood with him in his trials. They have fallen asleep in the garden. They will go on to deny him. They will go on to stand afar from him. You have stood with me in my trials. I remember in the movie Sound of Music when the children put the pine cone on the chair and Sister Maria sits on the pine cone and is in pain. And then when she greets the children, she said, I'd like to thank you all for this wonderful gift. And the more that they talk, the more they cry. As she tries to say to them, this is the higher road I'm taking. And as we think about these words, Jesus shamed them, but he didn't do that to cause them just complete pain. He took them to the next level. You have stood by me in my trials, but they didn't, and so this is what he does. He goes on to say, you are going to be the one to eat and drink at my table, be a part of my kingdom, and to judge over the tribes of Israel. In other words, you are limited in this situation by competing with one another, by thinking only about right now. I confer on you a kingdom. That's what we're destined for in God's eyes. Not squabbling, not one-upmanship, none of that. I want us to picture ourselves at the table. Do we treat the table like we were on a cruise ship? Who's been on a cruise? Anybody gone on a cruise or you've seen pictures of it? I've been on a cruise. On the cruise ship, you just eat all day long and all night long. And there is a menu and there is sometimes a placement of seating. So I want to ask us, are we like the people at the table on the cruise ship? Do we take the menu and just eat only what we want, not necessarily what's good for us? Do we make sure that we're first in line with the doors open so that we can be seated? Do we get upset at the servers? Do we know them by name? Are we generous in our gratuities beyond the ticket price? Do we look to sit at the best place or even make sure that we're with the captain? Well, we know also on the cruise ship as an image and this table as a metaphor, we think about 20% of the people are doing all of the work, right? And so on the cruise ship, 80% are just enjoying themselves, gorging at the table, walking around the deck, going on the cruises. Meanwhile, the entertainers, the cooks, the crew that operate the ship, all of the 20% are doing all the work while the 80% enjoy. I know this is going to shock you, but it happens in the church. 20% do 80%. Do you know that I can celebrate today that over 200 people filled out our time and talent? And that's great news out of our 3,000 members. The challenging news is that only 200 people filled out our time and talent out of 3,000 people. We want to invite, encourage, and lovingly hold accountable those who have not yet found a place to serve. Do we ever think about what it takes to serve God's table? The table where he said he is among us as one who serves. The table of Jesus, the communion table that we come to to take the bread and the cup. How frustrated he must have been when they're sitting there arguing about who's more important. And he is about to give up his life for them and for us. True service to him at the table is filled with commitment and love. We need to put ourselves in the place of the disciples, and we need to be put in our place about not thinking more of ourselves. We need to realize that as we listen to this menu that is offered to us in a day where people are so consumer-oriented, 
Do we decide that we're here to engage and serve in a way that changes lives or that we're served? I love the witness today of Katie and Dan Reeder, all three services, and at the early service, they were corralling three of their four children under the age of seven. Just reaching, lovingly holding them while they're talking, it was like watching a ballet. And I thought about that powerful witness of how many ways that we can serve. We are not here to betray him. He knows that. We want to be in the place of obeying him. Not to betray him, but to obey him. We don't want to sit around measuring ourselves against other people, the super Christian, judging those who shouldn't be at his table. The way Jesus turned that question toward the future of God wanting them to be a part of eating and drinking is so powerful for us today. Instead of the disciples saying, who among us will betray him, what if we turned that phrase and interpreted it this way? Instead of saying, who is it among us to break his heart, what if we said, who is it among us to serve him? We need to do that. That is powerful. And then as we think about the disciples and the way in which they served, they didn't fill out a survey monkey with Jesus. He went and got them, the 12, and he called them to follow him. He called them to do the work of ministry. And there are so many different ways, and he did it invitationally, not coercively. That's how we invite people into service. We also have to realize in that service when we're doing it that we need to pray about what God wants us to do. Sometimes there, there are people, and I've heard this in ministry, throughout 40 years of ministry, 22 ordained, there are always people in every church. I don't know why. I don't know how it got started. It's just everywhere. There are people who feel like they have to be courted to be asked to serve. We call that whining and dining. So anybody wine and dine? Anybody been wine and dined in your business? It's courting people. And yet, the wine that Jesus serves and the meal he offers is nowhere appropriate in a culture where people feel they should be courted in that way. It's quite the opposite. We need to always be looking for ways to serve. Sometimes people forget in the ministry of the church how much there is to do. Just on a, on a weekly basis and beyond, our ushers, communion servers, sound technicians, choirs, office volunteers, folding the orders of worship, kitchen angels that cook wonderful meals on Wednesday night, serving and cleaning up, trustees that open and close the building and look after this massive facility, Stephen ministers, funeral teams, mission teams, the altar and baptismal font care. The list goes on and on for that work. Jesus needs us to serve. We are invited to take our place at the table. You heard Katie say, we've got the extravaganza coming up. We need volunteers. We have this amazing consignment sale coming up. They work all year round for two consignment sales that is the largest fundraiser for missions in our church. These women put this together, and this week, if you can help volunteer, would you please contact them and offer your time? We have the opportunities throughout the year, what we do with Adopt-A-Family, all the ways we serve at the Norcross Co-op, there are always ways to do it. And so the clergy team wants to invite us to this table of service and to attempt in our journey to do these three things. To participate in a spiritual gifts class and take an assessment to help you know what your gifts are and where best to serve. Two, we want you to serve at least one hour per week in a ministry that supports the inner workings of the church. Three, we would like to encourage you to participate one hour a month in the ministries of justice and compassion, what we know as Matthew 25 ministries, Jesus telling us to minister to the least of these. We know that we haven't always responded as a church to those who have signed up in other instruments in the past, but we are working on that, and that's when we need you to come beating down our door and say, you didn't call me back. And we will do it, and we will make sure you have a place. Friends, who is at his table is very important. And he invites everyone to his table. I want us to remember that as he invites us to serve. 
as we plug into that power, as we find that energy, not focusing on ourselves, but helping other people, helping be a part of the kingdom work. So I want us to think about that now. The hour has come. We need to take our place at the table with him. If not now, when? If not us, who? Plug into the power of God through service. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we open